With additive manufacturing, your 3D models may become too complex to be triangulated into a 3MF or an STL, especially after latticing operations. If your CAD system exports slice files, check out how NetFab prepares print jobs even without a 3D model. As a starting point, we have a geometry that is available in a slice format, such as a CLI, which stands for Common Layer Interface. NetFab reads and edits a variety of different slice formats in its slices environment. Working with slices in the first place means that we don't have a proper 3D model present. This saves ourselves a lot of processing resources that would be required to display and calculate the geometry. In order to navigate through the third dimension, we now have to scroll through all the different layers using the slider bar here on the right and see how the slice areas are changing. For starters, the slices environment allows me to perform basic operations such as moving, rotating and scaling your stack. Here you can see me creating duplicates in a rectangular order if I wanted to check how many of these slices fit on my build plate. Let me just quickly delete these copies again as we don't need them further. Our Metal AM users, however, love its capabilities when it comes to advanced laser path generation. Based on your input geometry, you can now apply a variety of different offset and filling strategies. In this case, let's start with a contour exposure first. In here, we can assign our contour offset. As you can see, a new element has been created in our tree and if you look closely and zoom in a little, you can tell that there is a second contour that has been offset to the inside of our starting geometry. With the right click on the element in the tree, you can access further properties. I, for example, like to change all my contours into a similar kind of colors to see them directly, but you may also go ahead and just rename them into something easier. Next, we want to create a hatch filling. Why don't we go for stripes this time? Before we do that, we need to apply an additional boundary offset for the hatch vectors. Let's use our beam compensation preset for that. As we can see, a second new, rather dark blue line has been created, which sits right next to our first initial contour. Before we go into the hatch filling menu, we make sure to select the newly created beam compensation in the tree so that it serves as the actual input slice. All hatch options bring a variety of different settings, starting with the classics, hatch distance, length, over to angle increments and hatch sorting options, all for maximum flexibility. I am using this preset and with just that, my stripes are created. As we can see, the newly created hatch lines use the beam compensation as its boundary. Now, speaking of, it still seems to me that the contour and the beam compensation are quite close together. So why don't we just go ahead and change it by going back into the menu where we initially created it. Change it. For Point two should be all right. And now there is a proper distance between contour and hatch lines. Now with our contour and our stripe hatching in place, we can check the slice animation to see on the big picture if there is any further adjustment needed. Use the Animate Toolpath checkbox to get a very good indication on how your machine would expose this geometry. We're starting here with our green contour and we'll fill the geometry using our purple hatch lines. If you wanted to start with the hatching instead of with the contour, just go ahead and change the exposure order 
in the tree here on the left. In order to finish this preparation, I've also added two additional support components. The lattice support and the thickened up volume support were created earlier on and imported as an additional slice stack. The volume support, similar to what we have done for the part earlier on, has also obtained its simple hatch filling. So technically we're good to go. But before we export our tool paths into one of the many printer file formats, let's take a look on how long this print would take. To make the print time estimation as accurate as possible, it is worth checking the property section of each exposure element. Use this to add values for important exposure settings such as the exposure speed or the variety of different delays used by your printer's scan head. Again, we can apply these settings quickly with the ability to use customizable presets. With that in place, we can now check out our build time estimation. The build time estimation allows us to get more insight on the time each layer requires and lists these either in a table or in a graph. You might even save the times as a CSV and do your own calculations. Last step for now is the export of our tool paths. NetFab allows us to select from standard file formats, such as our current CLI, or even machine-specific formats that we can bring directly onto a printer. Let's go for the Additive Industries file format AI. We can see here that our laser settings have been directly transferred from our properties section. And if we didn't set these up before, we might still be able to do it right here. Global settings can be considered here as well in the second tab, which gives us access to gas flow management, controller recoder, and the build plate heating but that's very machine specific. Speaking of the additive industry system, while everything that we did here was just on a single laser basis, we might also include advanced capabilities to control multiple lasers as efficient as possible. This will help us to reduce the build time even further and keep the same flexibility that you've just seen. On top of that, all of the activities that we just went through can be automated using our built-in Lua API. Feel free to reach out if you want to learn more about that. Thank you very much and talk to you soon.